Okay. Today's Daf Yomi is Chagiga Daf Chafalaf. We're going to thank our sponsors for today's Daf Yomi. First of all, we'd like to thank our friend Gray uh, for sponsoring the whole month of March in memory of her brother, beloved brother Bobby Thomas, and in memory of her mother, uh, Barbara, um, and, and of her grandmother, uh, Grace. Uh, so we thank Beverly. Beverly. Be Beverly. Beverly. Mom. Thank but you, Gray. The other one's very nice, too. <laughs> okay. So thank you, Gray, for your sponsorship uh, in memory of your brother, your mother, and your grandmother. And also we thank today in, in, um, Jill Sachs for sponsoring the whole week in memory of her father, Chaim Feivel, Asbar Shimon, Vaster. And we also thank today uh, sponsorship also for the yard site of Lynn uh, Rosenfeld, the sister of Ellen Epstein. And also we thank um, Stephen and Shoshana Bryan for sponsoring today in memory of uh, their dear friend, uh, hold on, their memory of their dear friend, um, whose name was Mara Kochba, Mara Bat Shlomo. Okay, so today's Daf Yomi is Chagiga Daf Chof Aleph. And we had said in the Mishnah that there are 10, there were 10 or 11, depending on how you count, ways in which kachim is more stringent than truma. Just to review, kachim is the food, the sacred food that comes out of the temple, that, that certain parts of it that the kohanim can only eat in the temple, and that, that are like from the sin offerings, for example. And then there is truma, which is the food that is tithed and given to the kohanim, but that does not have to be eaten in the temple uh, or even in Jerusalem, that that is called teruma. And so that the, the mission had listed stringencies uh, in which we have malos, which we are called, or enhancements for kachim over truma. And the first example was uh, of the Mishnah that by kachim, the levels, no, malos levels that by, 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 by kachim, we say that the, uh, that the, that if you want to immerse two utensils in the mikvah at once, that it's not acceptable by kachim, but it is acceptable by teruma. So the Gemara asks the question, Mikodesh my time alone. Why is it not acceptable by kachim to immerse two utensils as part of the purifying of the utensils? Why can you not do two utensils, one inside the one inside the other for kachim? Why is it no good? So the first answer comes from Rabbi Ilah. Rabbi Ilah's answer is Nishek Vedo shall kliachotzeitz. Rabbi Ilah's answer is because the uh, the heaviness of the kli. It serves as a chatzitza. It serves as what's called an interposition. A chatzitza is an interposition. There's a concept that when you immerse something in the mikvah, all the water has to touch every part of the utensil. So if the two utensils are one inside the other, it's going to be a partition and the water will not get everywhere. The Gemara says, but wait, if Rabbi Eli is saying that the whole reason is because we don't want the waters to touch each part of each other, can't be. Rami de Seifa Mishum Chatzitza but we have in the concluding clause of the Mishnah, another case which talks about the concern about immersion where because there's going to be a chatzitza, so we have to be more stringent by kachim than truma. And so it's not likely that the Mishnah would have two cases that deal with the same concept of chatzitza. Why would the Mishnah have two cases that both deal with chatzitza? One case is sufficient. Why do you need to teach us the concept that kachim are more severe by chatzitza than, than truma? So the Gemara says, and how do we know that there's another case in the Mitchell which deals with this concept of the chatzitza, the interposition? The, the Katani Seifa, because we learn in the Mishnah, that the, that, uh, that the laws of Hektish, when you immerse it in the mikvah, is not the same as Chuma. Sheva Kodesh, that when it comes to Hektish, Matir Uman Gev Umat of Achka Kosher, that by Kachim, before you immerse something in the mikvah, first what you do is you are. Matir. First, you untie any knots there so that the water can get to every place. Then you're magim. Then you dry it out so you make sure that there's nothing on it when you immerse it so that the water gets to every place. Then you're matbil. Then you immerse it in the mikvah. kosher. And only then do you uh, do you tie the knots once you take it out. Because if you don't do this first, the water is not going to get to every place. But by truma kosher va'achar kach matbil. But by truma first you on um, first you uh, uh, you can even leave it tied if you want, and only then should you immerse it. So the Gemara asked the question, so, so, so we see that, why would Rabbi Eloi say that the first part is chatzitza when it's certainly possible 
when the second part of the Mishnah also refers to Chatzitza. So the Gemara answer is, you're right, because it's possible that both parts are actually dealing with the Chatzitza. Reisha the Sefer Mishim Chatzitza. Both the first clause and the second clause both deal with Chatzitza. How so? Uh, how so? The e Ashmin and Reisha, which if we just had the first clause, which refers to the case of immersing two utensils at once, I would have said, what's the reason why you can't do that by Kachim? We might have said the reason why we can't do that by Kachim is because the both utensils, if you put one inside the other, the first, the one that is inserted might be so heavy that it hits the bottom. And therefore you can't uh, you can't, there's no interposition between the water. And the water doesn't get to every place because the two vessels are touching and the water can't get to that spot. Of all safe, but by the case of the, the garment the knots, the lake of Kveda Shakli, we don't have the two utensils touching each other. Then I might have said, that we don't have to even be concerned by Kachim. It's not a it's not an interposition. Yes, mean and safe. And if we had the latter clause, which is only talking about the garments, you have to untie the knots. I might have said, the reason why for Kachim it's not a concern there is Mishum the Kitra. Uh, the Maya do game because when you have knots and you're sticking it in a water that it tightens up right away, we're on top of 21 feet, it tightens up right away. And so, therefore, once it tightens up right away, uh, the water can't get everywhere of Orasia. But in the case of your, you have the one utensil inside the other utensil, Ema, I might have said, the Maya, I might have said that the water causes the other utensil to float. And since it's causing the other utensil to float, therefore, in those circumstances, we're going to say that we'll have a chatzitza. It's not an interposition. So therefore, for this reason, since we're talking about two different scenarios where there could potentially be an interposition, the mission lists both cases. And so therefore, uh, and so therefore, we needed to list both cases. And the Gemara says, not only does Rabbi Eli say this here, but we have actually 11 cases li listed in the mission, 11 different ways in which Tonshim is more severe than Truma. But we're going to say that Rabbi, since Rabbi Eli is categorizing two of them as basically the same, therefore he really is only saying that there are 10 separate cases. So therefore Rabbi Eli, what time is it? Well, Rabbi Eli is consistent with his reasoning. Rabbi Eli, Amar Hanita Bar Papa, Esther Baal There are actually only 10 ways in which God Shim in our mission is listed as being more severe than Truma. The first five Applied to both Kachim and to Chulin. Excuse me. The first five apply to both the Kachim and to Chulin. Shenasal Taras Hakodesh. The first five not only apply to Truma, to Kachim, but they also apply to what's called Truma that was done al Taharos Hakodesh. That was done on that. If you say I'm going to have the Chulin being done on the basis of it being Kodesh, assuming that it is Kodesh. So that's the meaning. You live your life, your Chulin, as though it's Kodesh. So not only are we going to be strict by Kachim itself. But also by Chulin Shenaso Taras Hakodesh, and that's the first five. And the Gemara is going to explain why. And the Achronos, the last five, the Kodesh of Below Chulin Shenaso Taras Hakodesh. The last five is only good for Chulin, is only good for Kachim, but we don't have to apply them to the Chulin that's done at Taras Hakodesh. My time. And what's the difference between the first five and the last five? So the Gemara explains Chamesh Kamaisa. The first five, we're not going to go through all of them, but the first five have a biblical basis. Like, for example, if the, if the, if the immersion is not valid, they remain ritually impure. That's biblical law. So therefore, the rabbis made a decree, so the rabbis made a decree both for Kachim and for Chulun that was done, as though it were Kachim. That's right, but in the latter five, the Raisbo Drawer the Tumadiraisa, uh that where there's no concern whatsoever about biblical Tuma, the latter five. Then the Raisu Drawer Tuma Media Raisa, Gazu Baraban Kodesh, uh Khul Janasa Tarasa Kodesh, Gazu Baraban. And therefore the rabbis only made a creed for Kochim, but not for Kul, and that was Donald Tarasa Kodesh. What is the um What's the uh, what's the example? The latter five have no biblical basis. Like the last case, for example, the last case in the Mishnah talks about an onain, uh, somebody who is a mourner, and the, before the body is buried, he's not allowed to eat kachim. He's not allowed to eat the uh, sacred food, and and so therefore the rabbis made a decree that even when the body is buried, before he eats kachim, he should immerse in the mikvah. That's a totally rabbinic concept. So anyway, we see from here, this is Rabbi Uwai. Rabbi Uwai's position is consistent. What does Rabbi Uwai say? Rabbi Uwai's position is that the reason why you can't immerse two utensils at the same time 
is because we're concerned that the utensils will be touching during the immersion and that there'll be what's called an achatzitza, an interposition, and it's not a valid immersion. That's what Rabbi Law says. So really there are only 10 cases in which kachim is more stringent than truma listed in our Mishnah. But the, but the Gemara now brings a second approach. Rava says, no. Rava says, me the seifa. Having Mishum Chatzitza, Rabbi says, no, since the concluding cause, the case of the garment with the knots is because of an interposition, well, since that's the case in the Seifa, Reisha La Mishum Chatzitza. Therefore, the first cause is not because of Chatzitza. The first cause must be talking about a totally different case. So therefore, what's the reason why we can't immerse two utensils at the same time? The Reisha Ainu Taima, what's the reason in the first cause? Gezeira Shevoyatpil Mechatin Mitzinoros Pekri Sheim Bapiv we're concerned if you're going to immerse one utensil in the other, then it's going to be a problem. What's the problem? There are certain utensils you need to immerse, which they are very, very small, like a needle. And if you immerse a needle and you put the needle inside another utensil, and then if the if the, if the other utensil you put it in, is, is, it ha- doesn't have a spout that's the size of a shvoferis anud, like the size of a hollow reed, which we'll talk about in a few moments, how that how big that is exactly, then we're going to assume that that this utensil that it's in, that the needle's in, is an enclosed utensil. And the water that's it, that even the water that gets in there is not going to be connected to the waters of the mikvah, the water is around it. And so therefore that's not a valid immersion. So Rav is saying, what's well, the reason why we don't allow you to immerse two utensils, one in the other, because you might come to immerse in one utensil in a utensil where the opening, the spout, is not the size of a reed. And then it'll be like you didn't immerse it in a mikvah because the, the inner utensil will not be connected to the mikvah waters outside. And so therefore we say for kachim it's no good, but for truma we're going to allow it. So, and how do we know that such a concern is a problem, that if you have a spout that's smaller than the size of a reed, that any water that gets in there is considered disconnected from the mikvah? Because it's not, like we learned in the Mishnah Mikvos, where we learned, ear of mikvos, ear of means you want to combine two bodies of water together, kishvoferos anud. It needs to be, if you want to combine two bodies of water together to make them the size of a mikvah, it needs to be, the space between them needs to be at least the size of this hollow reed, like it's like it's uh, thickness and like it's uh, and like it's cavity. Meaning to say, on top of twenty-two a, come on. So you can put two fingers in there and and twirl them around. So uh, so so therefore, so that's the concept. So therefore, Rav is saying, what's the reason we can't immerse two utensils one inside the other? Because you might come to uh, immerse a needle inside a utensil where there is not a spout that's a, that's the required size. And therefore the inner utensil is not gonna be considered to be in the mikvah. Even if water gets in there, it's gonna be considered disconnected from the mikvah. So the Gemara says, So, so Rava's position must be, where well, Rava says you can't immerse the two utensils one inside the other, his position must be like Rav Nachman in the name of Rava Baravua. Who's taught that there are Yud Aleph Malos Shanukan, that there are actually 11 Malos listed in the Mishnah, not 10 like, like Rabbi Law said, but, but actually 11, not 10 like Rabbi Law said in the name of Rabbi Hanina Bar Papa, but Rabbi who says that the case of the emerging of immersing of the utensils is different than the case of than the case of the garments. He says that there are 11. And he says, Shesh Rishonos. The first six apply, since we saw that they're biblically connected, they apply to Kachim and Chulun that was done as though it was Kachim. And so fine. So the Gemara says, okay, so Rabbi Law is saying that the reason why you can't immerse the two utensils in the other is because it might lead uh, to uh, Chatzitza, that the water doesn't get everywhere. Whereas, Rava says, no, the reason is because you might come to immerse it in a utensil which doesn't have a big enough spout and then the water is disconnected. What's the difference between them? Is there a distinction? Is there a case where there's a distinction between Rav and Rav Eli? Where says, yeah, there is. Let's say you have a basket. Gargutani is a big basket. And you put another utensil in. You don't put a utensil in a tea kettle, which is like this small spout, but you put a utensil in a big basket and you immerse it. According to, the, according to Rabbi Eli, it says we're concerned is that the utensils might be touching each other. 
Well, if it's a large basket, you haven't alleviated that problem. And so therefore they're going to touch each other. It's a problem. According to the one who says we're concerned that you might come to immerse it in a, um, uh, you might come to immerse the needles in a utensil that doesn't have a, an opening the size of a reed. He says, that, but that concern is alleviated because if you have a basket, there's no spout there. And so therefore we don't have to be concerned. You're going to come to immerse it in a utensil with a small spout. So if you want to immerse two utensils for kachim in a large basket, Rav, Rav would say it's okay. And Rav Eli would still say it's no good. Rav would say it's okay because he's not concerned about the chatzitza there. But Rav Eli would say it's okay. No, Rav would say it's okay. Rav Eli would say it's, it's still no good. I mean, my, my difficulty with that is that even according to Rava, he's still concerned about Chatzitza. He just doesn't think you need to say it twice. So why, why, how would he deal with the question of the Tzricha that we saw before that there was still a concern about the Chatzitza there? I guess we'd have to, uh, we'd have to um, uh, look at the Rishonim on that. No, well, then let's see what they say here. Yes, we don't have to. Con- we don't have to be concerned about a chatzitza in that case. Is what he would say. Okay. Anyway, there's a lot of questions about this this analysis because generally speaking, when the rabbis make a gezerah, we a decree. We don't we don't draw distinctions between the cases. But we leave that aside because it is the dafyoni. So the Gemara says, "Ba'az the rabba tamei." And rabba is consistent with his logic. I'm a rabba. Salva the gutoni shemilan kelim. So Rava says uh, he's consistent because Rava's on the position. If you put a utensil inside a basket uh, and you immerse it in the mikvah, it's going to be tahor. Because he says there, there's no concern of chatzitza and we don't have to be concerned about the spout being too narrow. And then he says, a second scenario. Oh yes, great, please. Can't uh, hear you. No, I'm here. <laughs> I'm not as fast as you are. Um, so uh, two things. One, I was completely unaware until this morning that uh, I hate adjectives. I was unaware until this morning that you placed utensils into mikvahs. Uh, is there a category of utensil? Is it for the use for sacred use? Is that why it needs to be um, immersed? And the other question is not about utensils, but I have hair extensions. And so if I submerge myself into a mikvah, does that mean that um, I'm, uh, I'm not going to be purified because the water can't get between where the attachment of the extension is to my hair? I mean, this is really granular, you know, minutia. So, but- no, no, this is so, okay. So let's, let's deal with your questions uh, first. So the first question is, here we're talking about cases of ritual purity, purifying utensils to be used. And that's why the utensils need to be immersed. But the uh, but in general, people should be aware that it's a biblical law that if you that when you get a metal or glass utensil from uh, and if a Jew buys it from somebody who's not of the Jewish faith that and it's a food item utensil that before one uses it, one is required to immerse it in a mikvah. That's why that's that's a bit biblical law. And but 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 some laws have mazel and some laws don't. And a lot of people don't keep this law because they're. They're unaware of it, but that is a biblical law that we all have to be careful about. So Rabbi, does that include um, a Shabbat night at dinner, you know, when you wash your hands, do those those uh, utensils need to be? Uh, so that utensil is not used for food, that's just for washing your hands. So that, that doesn't require immersion, but it, it has to be an item that's used for food. So mm-hmm. like your knives, your, your cutlery, your, 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 your silverware, uh, for example. Okay, but now, and the second thing is, so there are certain things that people wear on their body where they could be a chatzitza and they could not be. So um, the question, of, so one of the things is that, uh, I don't know exactly how hair extensions work and I don't want to answer the question about it because uh, you need to have books in front of me, but if it's something that you typically 
would remove and take off, then you would then you would take it off from your body. But if you always leave it in, it's always in there and it's tied into your body, then my assumption is that since it's always in, my assumption is that there's room to say you don't need to remove it before going in the mikvah. But I'm not sure I would want to check it, but that will be my assumption. But I need to check that out. Like if it's like a weave, you weave your hair before, so it's in order to make your hair look thicker, it's always there. Then we have a concept, rubo, rubo, that if that 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 it wouldn't be a problem, but again, I I don't like to answer any questions until I have a book in front of me, so I'm not going to answer that. But I, but I I I'll look into it. My assumption no, no, would be that. No need. Okay. I appreciate it. I appreciate okay. it. Thank you. Okay. So the Gemara the Gemara then asks the next question. Mikva shachalku. Let's say you have a mikvah, which you divided, let's say you have a mikvah, a mikvah has to be a minimum size of 40 saw, and you put this big basket in the middle of, of the mikvah, and thereby you divided the waters. Hatovel shamo also a tefillah. If you immerse there, the immersion is not valid. The immersion in the mikvah is not going to be valid because we're going to say it doesn't have the required amount. So therefore we're going to say it's not valid because it doesn't have the required amount. And and proof of this is we can't connect the different parts to each other. Because the ground is all porous. And so, so therefore, anytime you have something coming from the ground, you could say, well, it's all connected to the other water, so to speak. It's not enough to have like some little connection. We need to have 40 saw in one place. And then we could connect it, but we need to have the 40 saw in one place. Obviously, this is a very controversial line. And so there's a lot to, to uh, discuss it. But I'm just going to put out there that it's a, that it's a controversial on exactly how to understand this phrase. But, uh, but basically, the Gemara says you need the 40 saw in one place. And now the Gemara says a very interesting idea, which is counterintuitive. That which we said that the, that the immersion is no good if the spout is less than the, the two fingers. Hadi, mili, when do we say that? Bikli tower, by a pure utensil of a bakuitame, where you come to immerse a pure utensil and you have something in the inner utensil is inside a, a utensil where the spout is less than two fingers, we're gonna say it's not valid. But let's say you're immersing a two utensils and the outer utensil is itself ritually impure. Bakuitame, then we might've said, Nigu de salka tfilo kule gufa de mana salku namil kem despe. Then we have counterintuitively the idea that if the fur, the outer one is itself ritually impure, we say that since we've come to immerse everything, we've come to immerse the outer utensil and we're transforming its status from Tumata Tahara. Therefore, excuse me, therefore we're going to say that once the outer one is transformed, therefore it, it goes up and includes everything that's inside of it. So, so, um, so that's what we say. Salka lahunami lakeum de ispe, de tanan, as we learned in uh, Mishnah in Mikvos, we learned. Kalem Shemilan Kalem Vitbilan. Let's say you filled up a utensil inside another utensil and you immerse it in the mikvah. We say under those circumstances, and under those circumstances, the, the utensils are going to be ritually pure. So under those circumstances, I'm talking about a basket, so it's going to be okay. But if you didn't immerse it, Mayam Amuravim, Achi Muravim Kishfafaras Anud. The waters that mix together, they have to be the size of this, this hollow reed. So the Gemara says, well, we, this phrase doesn't make any sense in second clause. My Amar. It does not mean vim lo tavol, that if you didn't immerse it. So this is what this, how we read that source. Vim vim When do we say that the two utensils are good? That's if you needed to immerse both. But if you didn't need to immerse both, and the water comes into it, into the inner one, and you only needed to immerse the inner one, because the outer one was ritually pure, then actually that, that is only um, that is only works in a, in a situation where the tube, uh, where the spout was the size of these two fingers. So the Gemara says, and this dispute between Rav and Rabbi Lai, again, where Rabbi Lai says that by it comes to a basket, uh, if you immerse two utensils, one inside the basket, it's not, it's a problem of an interposition. And Rava says that there is not a problem, it's only a problem if the spout is too small, 
Mahad the Rabbi Rabbi Y is a Tanai. This is actually a dispute amongst the Tanaim. The Tanya, we learned in the Brisa. Salva Gargutani, let's say you have the basket, Shemil and Kalan Vitbilan, that you fill them up with utensils and then you immerse them. Bela Kodesh, Bela Truma Tahorin. Now, let's say you have this basket and you immersed it. It's good both for Kachim and Truma. Truma for sure and Kachim also. This is consistent with Rava's position. He allows it by a case of Kachim, where it's a basket. Abashol says, with Truma Velola Kodesh. But Abashol is like Rabbi Yuai. He says, such a case, it's only going to be good for Truma, but by Kachim, we're going to be strict that maybe it's an interposition. So the Mara says, well, if Abba Shaul is worried that it's a chatzitza, that there is that the, the utensils are not properly immersed, so the truma also should not be valid because the water touches, so we shouldn't be able to use it for truma either. So the Gemara says, no, Aman Kamrin, and who are we talking to? Who's who's immersing the utensils that, that we need and they're bringing the karjim to? Chaverim, we're bringing it to Chaverim. We're bringing it to the Chaverim who work in the who work in the temple, these Kohanim. Chaverim, when it comes to the Chaverim, we're going to say, Meida, Yadi. The Chaveim are going to know. They're going to know that you need to have these at the at the mouth of the spout two uh, um, two um, two fingers worth. And so therefore it's only going to be a concern for for truma, but not for kachim. They'll know and they won't use it if it was not immersed properly. So the Gemara says, Iyachi Kodesh Nami. Uh, by, by Kachim also they shouldn't be they should know and should be allowed to use it to immerse something in, in a utensil which has a spout less than two which has a, which, in, in a utensil because they'll know not to do it if there is a spout less than two fingers and Mara says no by Kachim we're concerned that the Amarts will see him immerse it in, in a utensil and then the Amarts will go Basil and, and, and then the Amarts will go and immerse his own utensil in that. The Azomatbil Truma. So, excuse me, the Azomatbil. And then he'll go and immerse his own, his own vessel. The Amarts will see him do it by Kachim. So the Gemara says, well, Truma Nami Kazile. Why do we say that by Truma? The Truma is the food that the Kohen eats. The Amarts will also see the Kohen immersing it and use it. So, why are we concerned about the Amarts in the case of Truma? So the Gemara says, um, so the Gemara says, um, no, the Gemara says, no, the Gemara says, no, the Kohen knows not to accept the Truma from the Amarats because he knows he's not careful about the ritual purity involved with it. So he won't accept it as a gift. So why don't we say that by Kachim also, the Kohen won't accept it or the Chavar won't accept it from the Amarats. Now, if you don't accept the Kachim from the Amarats, Eva, that's going to cause hatred. It's going to cause animosity. He comes to give you his sacrificial food. He's coming to give you his offering. And you say, no, I don't, I'm not going to accept it from you because I'm worried that you immerse it in a utensil which doesn't have a spout the size of two fingers. Next thing you know, they're not talking for 30 years. It's a terrible, terrible thing. Well, the Gemara says, well, Truma Nami Havila Eva. Well, why don't we have the same concern by the Truma? He's going to give the Kohen a gift. The Gemara says, no, by Truma, well, let's put If the Kohen doesn't accept the Truma, the Amaris is not going to care. The Azo Yaiva will call Amaris. He'll eat Chavre. He says, yeah, he, everybody has another Kohen you can give it to. The one, the Kohanim who hung out in the temple, they were always Chaverim. They were very careful. So there, there's nobody to give it to. But the ones throughout the world, that you'll find somebody else. So the Gemara says, and, and this, okay, we'll stop here because tomorrow we're going to bring up the discussion. How do we know that we have a concern about Ava, about hatred? All right, well, we'll. Uh, Stop here. Okay. Well, was I recording this? Yeah, did I record this? I'm not sure. I'm not yes, sure. Yes, I did. I, I did. Rabbi